Plotinus, Greek, Plotinos, Plotinos, c. 204-5-270 was a major Greek-speaking philosopher of the ancient world. In his philosophy, described in the Enneads, there are three principles, the one, the intellect, and the soul. His teacher was Ammonius Saccas and he is of the Platonic tradition. Historians of the 19th century invented the term Neoplatonism and applied it to him and his philosophy which was influential in late antiquity. Much of the biographical information about Plotinus comes from Porphyry's preface to his edition of Plotinus Enneads. His metaphysical writings have inspired centuries of pagan, Islamic, Jewish, Christian, and Gnostic metaphysicians and mystics. Biography <inaudible> 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 Porphyry reported that Plotinus was 66 years old when he died in 270, the second year of the reign of the emperor Claudius II, thus giving us the year of his teacher's birth as around 205. Eunipius reported that Plotinus was born in the Deltaic Lycopolis in Egypt, which has led to speculations that he may have been a native Egyptian of Roman, Greek, or Hellenized Egyptian descent. Plotinus had an inherent distrust of materiality an attitude common to Platonism, holding to the view that phenomena were a poor image or mimicry mimesis of something «higher and intelligible» vi, I, which was the «truer part of genuine being». This distrust extended to the body, including his own. It is reported by Porphyry that at one point he refused to have his portrait painted, presumably for much the same reasons of dislike. Likewise Plotinus never discussed his ancestry, childhood, or his place or date of birth. From all accounts his personal and social life exhibited the highest moral and spiritual standards. Plotinus took up the study of philosophy at the age of 27, around the year 232, and traveled to Alexandria to study. There he was dissatisfied with every teacher he encountered until an acquaintance suggested he listen to the ideas of Ammonius Saccas. Upon hearing Ammonius' lecture, he declared to his friend, This was the man I was looking for, and began to study intently under his new instructor. Besides Ammonius, Plotinus was also influenced by the works of Alexander of Aphrodisias, Numenius, and various Stoics. <laughs> Expedition to Persia and return to Rome After spending the next eleven years in Alexandria, he then decided, at the age of around 38, to investigate the philosophical teachings of the Persian philosophers and the Indian philosophers. In the pursuit of this endeavor he left Alexandria and joined the army of Gordian III as it marched on Persia. However, the campaign was a failure, and on Gordian's eventual death Plotinus found himself abandoned in a hostile land, and only with difficulty found his way back to safety in Antioch. At the age of 40, during the reign of Philip the Arab, he came to Rome, where he stayed for most of the remainder of his life. There he attracted a number of students. His innermost circle included Porphyry, Aemilius Gentilianus of Tuscany, the senator Castricius Firmus, and Eustachius of Alexandria, a doctor who devoted himself to learning from Plotinus and attending to him until his death. Other students included, Zethos, an Arab by ancestry who died before Plotinus, leaving him a legacy and some land, Zotacus, a critic and poet, Paulinus, a doctor of Scythopolis, and Serapion from Alexandria. He had students amongst the Roman Senate beside Castricius, such as Marcellus Arontius, Sabinillus, and Rogantianus. Women were also numbered amongst his students, including Gemina, in whose house he lived during his residence in Rome, and her daughter, also Gemina, and Amphiclea, the wife of Ariston the son of Iamblichus. Finally, Plotinus was a correspondent of the philosopher Cassius Longinus. <laughs> Later life While in Rome Plotinus also gained the respect of the Emperor Gallinus and his wife Salonina. At one point Plotinus attempted to interest Gallinus in rebuilding an abandoned settlement in Campania, known as the City of Philosophers, where the inhabitants would live under the constitution set out in Plato's laws. An imperial subsidy was never granted, for reasons unknown to Porphyry, who reports the incident. 
Porphyry subsequently went to live in Sicily, where word reached him that his former teacher had died. The philosopher spent his final days in seclusion on an estate in Campania which his friend Zethos had bequeathed him. According to the account of Eustachius, who attended him at the end, Plotinus' final words were, "...try to raise the divine in yourselves to the divine in the all." Eustachius records that a snake crept under the bed where Plotinus lay, and slipped away through a hole in the wall, at the same moment the philosopher died. Plotinus wrote the essays that became the Enneads over a period of several years from ca. 253 until a few months before his death 17 years later. Porphyry makes note that the Enneads, before being compiled and arranged by himself, were merely the enormous collection of notes and essays which Plotinus used in his lectures and debates, rather than a formal book. Plotinus was unable to revise his own work due to his poor eyesight, yet his writings required extensive editing. According to Porphyry, his master's handwriting was atrocious, he did not properly separate his words, and he cared little for niceties of spelling. Plotinus intensely disliked the editorial process, and turned the task to Porphyry, who not only polished them but put them into the arrangement we now have. Major ideas <laughs> 1 Plotinus taught that there is a supreme, totally transcendent one containing no division, multiplicity, or distinction, beyond all categories of being and non-being. His one cannot be any existing thing. Nor is it merely the sum of all things compare the Stoic doctrine of disbelief in non-material existence, but is prior to all existence. Plotinus identified his one with the concept of good and the principle of beauty, I.6.9. His one concept encompassed thinker and object. Even the self-contemplating intelligence the noesis of the nous must contain duality. Once you have uttered the good, add no further thought, by any addition, and in proportion to that addition, you introduce a deficiency. 3.8.11 Plotinus denies sentience, self-awareness or any other action ergon to the one, to hain to n, v6.6, rather, if we insist on describing it further, we must call the one a sheer potentiality dynamis, or without which nothing could exist. 3.8.10 As Plotinus explains in both places and elsewhere e.g. v6.3, it is impossible for the one to be being or a self-aware creator god. At v.6.4, Plotinus compared the one to light, the divine intellect, nous, 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 first will towards good to the sun, and lastly the soul, psyche, psyche, to the moon, whose light is merely a derivative conglomeration of light from the sun. The first light could exist without any celestial body. The one, being beyond all attributes including being and non-being, is the source of the world but not through any act of creation, willful or otherwise, since activity cannot be ascribed to the unchangeable, immutable one. Plotinus argues instead that the multiple cannot exist without the simple. The less perfect must, of necessity, emanate or issue forth from the perfect or more perfect. Thus, all of creation emanates from the one in succeeding stages of lesser and lesser perfection. These stages are not temporally isolated, but occur throughout time as a constant process. The one is not just an intellectual concept but something that can be experienced, an experience where one goes beyond all multiplicity. Plotinus writes, we ought not even to say that he will see, but he will be that which he sees, if indeed it is possible any longer to distinguish between seer and seen, and not boldly to affirm that the two are one. <laughs> <laughs> Emanation by the one Superficially considered, Plotinus seems to offer an alternative to the orthodox Christian notion of creation ex nihilo out of nothing, although Plotinus never mentions Christianity in any of his works. 
The metaphysics of emanation aporo aporo e. or aporoia aporoia however, just like the metaphysics of creation, confirms the absolute transcendence of the one or of the divine, as the source of the being of all things that yet remains transcendent of them in its own nature, the one is in no way affected or diminished by these emanations, just as the Christian God in no way is affected by some sort of exterior nothingness. Plotinus, using a venerable analogy that would become crucial for the largely Neoplatonic metaphysics of developed Christian thought, likens the one to the sun which emanates light indiscriminately without thereby diminishing itself, or reflection in a mirror which in no way diminishes or otherwise alters the object being reflected. The first emanation is nous divine mind, logos, order, thought, reason, identified metaphorically with the demiurge in Plato's Timaeus. It is the first will toward good. From Nous proceeds the world soul, which Plotinus subdivides into upper and lower, identifying the lower aspect of soul with nature. From the world soul proceeds individual human souls, and finally, matter, at the lowest level of being and thus the least perfected level of the cosmos. Despite this relatively pedestrian assessment of the material world, Plotinus asserted the ultimately divine nature of material creation since it ultimately derives from the One, through the mediums of Nous and the world soul. It is by the good or through beauty that we recognize the one, in material things and then in the forms, I.6.6 .6 and I.6.9. The essentially devotional nature of Plotinus' philosophy may be further illustrated by his concept of attaining ecstatic union with the one henosis. Porphyry relates that Plotinus attained such a union four times during the years he knew him. This may be related to enlightenment, liberation, and other concepts of mystical union common to many Eastern and Western traditions. The true human and happiness Authentic human happiness for Plotinus consists of the true human identifying with that which is the best in the universe. Because happiness is beyond anything physical, Plotinus stresses the point that worldly fortune does not control true human happiness, and thus, there exists no single human being that does not either potentially or effectively possess this thing we hold to constitute happiness. Enards I 4.4 The issue of happiness is one of Plotinus' greatest imprints on Western thought, as he is one of the first to introduce the idea that eudaimonia happiness is attainable only within consciousness. The true human is an incorporeal contemplative capacity of the soul, and superior to all things corporeal. It then follows that real human happiness is independent of the physical world. Real happiness is, instead, dependent on the metaphysical and authentic human being found in this highest capacity of reason. For man, and especially the proficient, is not the couplement of soul and body. The proof is that man can be disengaged from the body and disdain its nominal goods. Enards I 4.14 The human who has achieved happiness will not be bothered by sickness, discomfort, etc., as his focus is on the greatest things. Authentic human happiness is the utilization of the most authentically human capacity of contemplation. Even in daily, physical action, the flourishing humans, act is determined by the higher phase of the soul. Enards 3.4.6 Even in the most dramatic arguments Plotinus considers if the proficient is subject to extreme physical torture, for example, he concludes this only strengthens his claim of true happiness being metaphysical, as the truly happy human being would understand that which is being tortured is merely a body, not the conscious self, and happiness could persist. Plotinus offers a comprehensive description of his conception of a person who has achieved eudaimonia. The perfect life involves a man who commands reason and contemplation. Enards I 4.4 A happy person will not sway between happy and sad, as many of Plotinus' contemporaries believed. Stoics, for example, question the ability of someone to be happy, presupposing happiness is contemplation, if they are mentally incapacitated or even asleep. Plotinus disregards this claim, as the soul and true human do not sleep or even exist in time, nor will a living human who has achieved eudaimonia suddenly stop using its greatest, most authentic capacity just because of the body's discomfort in the physical realm. The proficient's will is set always and only inward. Enards I 4.11 Overall, happiness for Plotinus is a flight from this world's ways and things. 
Theat 176 and a focus on the highest, i.e. forms and the one. Topic: <laughs> Henosis. Henosis is the word for mystical oneness, union, or unity in classical Greek. In Platonism, and especially Neoplatonism, the goal of henosis is union with what is fundamental in reality, the one, to hain the source, or monad, as is specified in the writings of Plotinus on henology, one can reach a state of tabula rasa, a blank state where the individual may grasp or merge with the one. This absolute simplicity means that the nous or the person is then dissolved, completely absorbed back into the monad. Here within the Enids of Plotinus the monad can be referred to as the good above the demiurge. The monad or dunamis force is of one singular expression the will or the one is the good all is contained in the monad and the monad is all pantheism. All division is reconciled in the one, the final stage before reaching singularity, called duality dyad, is completely reconciled in the monad, source or one see monism. As the one, source or substance of all things the monad is all-encompassing. As infinite and indeterminate all is reconciled in the dunamis or one. It is the demiurge or second emanation that is the nous in Plotinus. It is the demiurge creator, action, energy, or nous that perceives and therefore causes the force potential or one to manifest as energy, or the dyad called the material world. Nous as being, being and perception intellect manifest what is called soul, world soul. Henosis for Plotinus was defined in his works as a reversing of the ontological process of consciousness via meditation in the Western mind to uncontemplate toward no thought nous or demiurge and no division dyad within the individual being. Plotinus words his teachings to reconcile not only Plato with Aristotle but also various world religions that he had personal contact with during his various travels. Plotinus' works have an ascetic character in that they reject matter as an illusion non-existent. Matter was strictly treated as immanent, with matter as essential to its being, having no true or transcendental character or essence, substance or ousia. This approach is called philosophical idealism. Topic. Relation with contemporary philosophy and religion Topic. Plotinus's relation to Plato For several centuries after the Protestant Reformation, Neoplatonism was condemned as a decadent and oriental distortion of Platonism. In a famous 1929 essay, E. R. Dodds showed that key conceptions of Neoplatonism could be traced from their origin in Plato's dialogues, through his immediate followers e.g., Spevsippus and the Neopythagoreans, to Plotinus and the Neoplatonists. Thus Plotinus' philosophy was, he argued, not the starting point of Neoplatonism but its intellectual culmination. Further research reinforced this view and by 1954 Merlin could say the present tendency is toward bridging rather than widening the gap separating Platonism from Neoplatonism. Since the 1950s, the Tübingen School of Plato interpretation has argued that the so-called unwritten doctrines of Plato debated by Aristotle and the early academy strongly resemble Plotinus's metaphysics. In this case, the Neoplatonic reading of Plato would be, at least in this central area, historically justified. This implies that Neoplatonism is less of an innovation than it appears without the recognition of Plato's unwritten doctrines. Advocates of the Tübingen school emphasize this advantage of their interpretation. They see Plotinus as advancing a tradition of thought begun by Plato himself. Plotinus's metaphysics, at least in broad outline, was therefore already familiar to the first generation of Plato's students. This confirms Plotinus' own view, for he considered himself not the inventor of a system but the faithful interpreter of Plato's doctrines. <laughs> Plotinus and the Gnostics 
At least two modern conferences within Hellenic philosophy fields of study have been held in order to address what Plotinus stated in his tract against the Gnostics and to whom he was addressing it, in order to separate and clarify the events and persons involved in the origin of the term Gnostic. From the dialogue, it appears that the word had an origin in the Platonic and Hellenistic tradition long before the group calling themselves Gnostics or the group covered under the modern term Gnosticism ever appeared. It would seem that this shift from Platonic to Gnostic usage has led many people to confusion. The strategy of sectarians taking Greek terms from philosophical contexts and reapplying them to religious contexts was popular in Christianity, the cult of Isis and other ancient religious contexts including hermetic ones see Alexander of Abonuticus for an example. Plotinus and the Neoplatonists viewed Gnosticism as a form of heresy or sectarianism to the Pythagorean and Platonic philosophy of the Mediterranean and Middle East. He accused them of using senseless jargon and being overly dramatic and insolent in their distortion of Plato's ontology. Plotinus attacks his opponents as untraditional, irrational and immoral and arrogant. He also attacks them as elitist and blasphemous to Plato for the Gnostics despising the material world and its maker, the Neoplatonic movement though Plotinus would have simply referred to himself as a philosopher of Plato seems to be motivated by the desire of Plotinus to revive the pagan philosophical tradition. Plotinus was not claiming to innovate with the Enneads, but to clarify aspects of the works of Plato that he considered misrepresented or misunderstood. Plotinus does not claim to be an innovator, but rather a communicator of a tradition. Plotinus referred to tradition as a way to interpret Plato's intentions. Because the teachings of Plato were for members of the academy rather than the general public, it was easy for outsiders to misunderstand Plato's meaning. However, Plotinus attempted to clarify how the philosophers of the academy had not arrived at the same conclusions such as misotheism or dystheism of the creator God as an answer to the problem of evil as the targets of his criticism. <laughs> <laughs> Against causal astrology Plotinus seems to be one of the first to argue against the still popular notion of causal astrology. In the late Tractate 2.3, Are the Stars Causes? Plotinus makes the argument that specific stars influencing one's fortune a common Hellenistic theme attributes irrationality to a perfect universe, and invites moral depravity. He does, however, claim the stars and planets are ensouled, as witnessed by their movement. Topic. Influence Topic. Ancient world The Emperor Julian the Apostate was deeply influenced by Neoplatonism, as was Hypatia of Alexandria. Neoplatonism influenced many Christians as well, including Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite. Saint Augustine, though often referred to as a Platonist, acquired his Platonist philosophy through the mediation of the Neoplatonist teachings of Plotinus. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Christianity. Plotinus' philosophy had an influence on the development of Christian theology. In A History of Western Philosophy, philosopher Bertrand Russell wrote that to the Christian, the other world was the kingdom of heaven, to be enjoyed after death, to the Platonist, it was the eternal world of ideas, the real world as opposed to that of illusory appearance. Christian theologians combined these points of view, and embodied much of the philosophy of Plotinus. Plotinus, accordingly, is historically important as an influence in molding the Christianity of the Middle Ages and of theology. The Eastern Orthodox position on energy, for example, is often contrasted with the position of the Roman Catholic Church, and in part this is attributed to varying interpretations of Aristotle and Plotinus, either through Thomas Aquinas for the Roman Catholics or Gregory of Nyssa for the Orthodox Christians. Islam 
Neoplatonism and the ideas of Plotinus influenced medieval Islam as well, since the Sunni Abbasids fused Greek concepts into sponsored state texts, and found great influence amongst the Ismaili Shia. Persian philosophers as well, such as Muhammad al-Nasafi and Abu Yaqub Sijistani. By the 11th century, Neoplatonism was adopted by the Fatimid state of Egypt, and taught by their Dai. Neoplatonism was brought to the Fatimid court by Hamid al-Din al-Kirmani, although his teachings differed from Nasafi and Sijistani, who were more aligned with original teachings of Plotinus. The teachings of Kirmani in turn influenced philosophers such as Nazir Khusraw of Persia. <inaudible> Judaism As with Islam and Christianity, Neoplatonism in general and Plotinus in particular influenced speculative thought. Notable thinkers expressing Neoplatonic themes are Solomon ibn Gabirol Latin, and Moses ben Maimon Latin, Maimonides. As with Islam and Christianity, apophatic theology and the privative nature of evil are two prominent themes that such thinkers picked up from either Plotinus or his successors. Renaissance In the Renaissance the philosopher Marsilio Ficino set up an academy under the patronage of Cosimo de Medici in Florence, mirroring that of Plato. His work was of great importance in reconciling the philosophy of Plato directly with Christianity. One of his most distinguished pupils was Pico della Mirandola, author of an oration on the dignity of man. England In England, Plotinus was the cardinal influence on the 17th-century school of the Cambridge Platonists, and on numerous writers from Samuel Taylor Coleridge to W. B. Yeats and Kathleen Raine. India Savpali Radhakrishnan and Ananda Kumaraswamy used the writing of Plotinus in their own texts as a superlative elaboration upon Indian monism, specifically Upanishadic and Advaita Vedantic thought. Kumaraswamy has compared Plotinus' teachings to the Hindu school of Advaita Vedanta Advaita meaning, not to, or, non-dual. Advaita Vedanta and Neoplatonism have been compared by J. F. Stahl, Frederick Copleston, Aldo Magris and Mario Piantelli, Radhakrishnan, Gwen Griffith Dixon, and John Y. Fenton. The joint influence of Advaitin and Neoplatonic ideas on Ralph Waldo Emerson was considered by Dale Reaper in 1967. See also equals equals notes